Hello, I'm Michelle Davis of the Center for Manufacturing Research at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. Welcome to the Spring 2018 Golden Eagle Additively Innovative Virtual Lecture Series. This is the fifth semester we have produced this popular and informative series. The series is hosted by TTU Center for Manufacturing Research and the iMaker Space at TTU. The CMR is recognized as an accomplished center of excellence that draws together resources from the state of Tennessee, the university, industry, and government funding agencies into a cooperative effort to be on the leading edge of the latest technological advances in the manufacturing field. The iMaker space, located in the Volpe Library on Tennessee Tech's campus, has a goal of providing an interactive and collaborative space for students and faculty to use in pursuit of innovative and entrepreneurial projects. Additive manufacturing is a focus of both entities, and as such, this short virtual lecture series has been planned to highlight the best practices, potential problems, technological advances, innovations, and scientific contributions in additive manufacturing with expert talks from various institutions, industries, R&D centers and laboratories. Today, we are honored to hear from Eric Wooldridge, Professor of Additive Manufacturing, Workforce Development, and Pre-Engineering at Somerset Community College in Kentucky. His talk is titled, AM Research and Applications for Real World Production and Impact. We request that you mute your microphones and phones during this presentation for the most optimal experience. The speaker will provide his contact information for questions after the presentation is over. Thank you, and I now turn the presentation over to Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Make sure we can see all of that. And uh, are we good? All right. Okay, so... Uh, Welcome everyone. My name is Eric Wooldridge, professor here at Somerset Community College. My background is actually in engineering. Uh, I've got my PE license in about three different disciplines and I'm also a registered architect. So I get to do a lot of design. So when additive manufacturing became an opportunity for us to explore, you know, we jumped on it as a community college. And our goal overall is to show impact with this technology. Now I'm gonna kind of make the assumption that everyone actually understands what additive is at this point, and that we can do metal and plastics and polymers and about everything that you can imagine already. And we're gonna skip the introduction of the technology and just tell you a little bit about our focus. Our focus is low cost FDM or triple F applications, basically using desktop printers to do not only the prototyping, but also the production. We're also focused on helping existing companies integrate and also helping new companies get started. Typically companies or startup folks that don't actually have any funds to begin with, how they can take their great idea that they may have to market without having to sell their house or bring in lots of money to get started. So uh, the guiding question kind of what we do is, what can we do to speed up additive manufacturing in terms of embracing it? So many companies exist and so many companies are doing what they do and aren't taking advantage of additive yet, even though the technology is exploding across so many realms. So that's our guiding principle. How do we get more folks to embrace it and how do we get the consumer market to accept it? So in our research, we've actually uh, under, learn that people still do not understand a lot of what additive is. Now, obviously, those on, online with us today probably have a very good understanding of additive, but we deal with all kinds of folks who are just blown away and totally surprised that this technology even exists. You know, we still get people in our lab that look at, at the first part and say, oh my gosh, I didn't know you, you could do that. So it's a big deal to realize that a lot of the public a lot of entrepreneurs and startup companies out there, even companies that are in the manufacturing realm, still do not understand it. Also, we focus heavily on the rural manufacturing region. And you know, people will ask, you know, why is our focus on rural? And the answer is pretty simple. It's that rural manufacturing has a significant amount of impact on the overall supply chain. You know, your upper level companies are issuing contracts, but a lot of your tier four, five, and six 
are down in regions where there's low cost of living. There's low tax dollars and everything else, or low tax costs to actually operate, and so companies like to locate there. So the rural manufacturing plays a huge part. In fact, actually, the USDA released a, a great little report that talks about the significance of rural manufacturing, not only in the local economy, uh, but also just on the general sense of what it does for us as a country. And also, the an interesting fact is this, that during economic downturns, rural manufacturing plants are much more likely to survive than urban manufacturing plants. So there's a, there's a livelihood component to this that we're very interested in. Okay. And also the new the new marketplace shift. You know, you've got Amazon, you've got all of these different entities focusing on this internet marketplace, and such that if an individual becomes you know has a good reputation, they can sell a lot of product, and so that's offering a whole new business paradigm that we've never seen before. So in the overall process of all this, we also learn also what's the biggest problem, and that of course is lack of traction. People don't understand it. People don't understand additive, they're not taking advantage of it, and we are missing opportunities on a regular basis because the technology's there, people just aren't using it. So uh, we want to make additive embraced faster in rural areas and everywhere that we can by focusing on ways to use additive in a low cost form. So after having, after struggling for so long, talking to people about additive, showing them all the cool stuff that we do, we realized that we had to change our game plan. So our new game plan that we, we ran into or developed was to show people where the money is, also to show them what we call the Netflix model, give them a deal and let them experience additive for the first time for free with whatever project they have in mind. We also like to shock and awe folks with the, the power of the technology. And we also just want to show folks if you're gonna do this, if you're gonna to try to impact your region with this technology, here's the model to use. So SCC, or Somerset Community College, we've been in this for using additive for over five years. Uh, we've developed some grants. Uh, we uh, created the state's first um, technician level 3D printing certificate offered statewide through our community college system. And we've got the ball rolling, and we have plenty of unsuccessful attempts on how to do things. So we can definitely tell you how not to try to do this, and also what does work from our experience. But we've been at this for a while. We realized that partnerships were a, a great opportunity for us to get the word out. AM Watch um, with Tennessee Tech is awesome and just connecting this group. We're also starting to uh, get more companies associated with this and, and doing some of this work. We're, we're supported also in part by uh, 3D Print Life, which supplies us with different types of materials to try out and sort of show the market, here's what you can use. And also some companies are, are donating equipment or supporting some equipment. So it's really awesome partnership over the, over the years we've got to develop. But we start off with what really matters to these companies when they come into the lab and they see additive in action and they don't really know what to do with it. We focus on showing them where the money is. What big money's out there that they don't realize that it's changing their manufacturing platform. And uh, one of the things that we do here in Kentucky, is we point out that Kentucky's number one export is aerospace. Most people don't realize that, but we make roughly uh, $30 billion overall. Almost 11 billion of that is from aerospace. Now we're not producing planes per se, but we are producing the parts that go in aircraft and weapons and defense. So we're part, a significant part of that supply chain and a lot of our tax dollars come from the aerospace industry. And as many of you all know, Aerospace is probably one of the number one industries that is interested in additive manufacturing transitions. So that starts to get people's attention when we point that out. And um, we talk about the fact that most of the rural manufacturing is usually contract manufacturing for someone else, typically like your big enterprise level companies or ELCs, GE, uh, Boeing, um, any, even Honeywell. So if those companies are changing their contract structure and wanting newer additive parts, our folks need to be aware of that and be able to adapt to it when the time comes. And there's part of the skills gap that we're dealing with on a regular basis. And these ELCs are basically asking the question, you know, is there advantage to going additive or is there not? And many of you may have already seen this slide. You've seen this study by GE, you know, the Project Leap. And this is essentially the concept that they had an existing part, an existing design, it used to be 20 parts. Now they actually print it as one. 
great results. You know, it's five times stronger. It's 25% lighter in weight. They produce 40,000 of them. That's great. But then I turn around and ask my folks, what happened to the contracts associated with those 20 parts? And that's what gets their attention. When they start thinking about what happened to the conventional contracts, it makes them perk up. Also, you know, the information they provided was great. They talk about their turbo prop. You know, we went 855 parts down to 12 sub assemblies with 3D printed applications. Great results, as you can see on the screen. But again, the question is for the conventional folks, what happened to those contracts of that 855? And that's telling the story they're starting to see. Another case in point here we have a part system that was 300 parts, took 60 engineers typically to kind of make this happen. 50 suppliers to make those 300 parts, now potentially replaced by one 3D printed version, six to eight engineers, and one manufacturing source. And again, asking the question, what happened to the 300 contracts? And when you look at the part, it's, it's a no-brainer. I mean, the one on the left is the old way of doing it, the one on the right is the new way. And this looks like it belongs on the Nautilus from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. This looks like it is aerospace. And when you kind of show them this kind of money, this kind of impact, that's when companies and manufacturers start to pay attention. Then we expose them to the complexity that additive offers. Additive can do more from the inside and that conventional cannot. And so it's not necessarily that we're switching out printing to 3D printing to go apples to apples. It's that we're going to apples to a totally new, new type of fruit, so to speak. We can do things we can never do. We also talk about the fact that Caterpillar, you know, with their new engine design and uh, the, the fact that they looked at their additive folks as being able to produce things that their engineers could never even dream of before has allowed the engineers to design a new system and they potentially increased the lifespan of their engine almost two and a half times, going from 8,000 hours to overhaul to 20,000 hours before you <coughs> overhaul this engine because of additive complexity capability. And so when they start seeing those dollar signs, that's when folks start to pay attention. Previously, they were looking at additive as making keychains, and they see them in the schools, and they see these printers doing this little stuff, and they think that's cool, but they don't think about money. And this is the truth of the money. The ELCs, the enterprise level companies, are making strides. G, another one of their engine projects, the new data they showed was going to increase, potentially increase the Black Hawk helicopter by 161% double the range of the helicopter because of using additive manufacturing technology. And this is production stuff. Airbus, they're saying their buy to fly ratio is flipped. You know, it costs them less to produce things. So they want to print as much as possible. Even the whole removal of the UK from the European Union, the actual published strategy, the seven year strategy included this real push toward additive to potentially deal with all the problems they were about to have. And this was in their published study. And they even, you know, pointed out revenues potentially of up to six billion from this move, 175,000 jobs. So the data is out there, and the numbers talk, and that's what's really getting people to pay attention. Honeywell teamed up to drop 15 million down on a plant uh, or a contract down in Florida to produce more additive aerospace parts. BMW, you're looking at parts going in the car in the new i8 Roadster that are going to be 3D printed out of metal and part of the car production, not prototypes. HP's announcement on entering into the market in 2019, disrupting a $12 trillion industry. All this information matters. Or a Lichen dropped 55 million on a plant in North Carolina, still searching for a workforce to run the machines. So we're seeing potentially the skills gap associated with this as well. They're making deals left and right. For example, teaming up with Boeing to do the new standards for DOD and FAA so they can get more contracts. You know, the deal between Carbon and Adidas to print the midsoles, bringing in the ability to use the speed of the carbon technology, the carbon clip technology, and also the mechanical design and structure of honeycomb systems. You know, this is a huge deal and it's gonna allow them to customize shoes while in production. And again, we're not talking prototyping, we're talking production. The other thing that we looked for is we, we follow all this money. So $25 million here invested into a plant to produce metal powders, 60 million in Pittsburgh to update a plant to produce metal powders. We're seeing the metal powder money going crazy to scale up. Porsche talking about it, Bugatti talking about it, Ford talking about it, investments left and right. This is a titanium 3D printed system, that's a brake caliper system that's gonna be on their cars. 
again, not prototyping, actual production. Uh, another new car, they say they can 3D print and ready to mass produce. They give crazy cool data. And I can't go through all the data that we typically show because we just don't have enough time, but it's just to say that it's all out there. Amazon buying out a company that does body scanning, wanting to hit that fashion market so they can scan you at home and ship you 3D printed clothing or additive made clothing customized to you. And here's big money. You know, we're talking about the top chemical companies in the world, BASF, Dow, DuPont, and look what they're announcing. They are starting to create lines of 3D printing materials. These are the top dogs saying, we are creating new products for this platform, and that means a lot to us. And we're already seeing it. We've already got new filaments for our typical desktop printers that can be fire rated, uh, super crazy elongation capabilities, durability, carbon fiber, it's amazing. The Marines are doing everything from explosive, customized explosives for shape charging, to drones, just got trained on some of the new printing technology to be actually used in the battlefield, and the Navy, and the Army, and everyone is investing, investing, investing. Air Force, legacy parts, the data goes on. Australia, investing in researchers to develop energetic materials for explosives and solid rocket fuel, and we're talking millions of dollars spent just in the last couple years to scale up and switch over. The announcement by Aerodyne and NASA on the new engine they've got with 3D printed parts, they make quotes like, to produce even the most complex components, it's gonna dramatically lower the cost of going to space. All that speaks volumes to people in the manufacturing realm. Even if they don't realize it's going on, they'll pay attention to that. Scotland, and it's, I didn't even know Scotland had a space program. Turns out not only do they do, but they're actually using printing to actually launch equipment or scaling up to launch equipment into space and using additive. Crazy awesome stories. This one's pretty powerful. The fact that uh, this new project, the Wonder Boom production facility in South Africa, is gonna claim that they can produce two aircraft a month off this design and actually be able to do it with what they say as little outsourcing to other suppliers and without being burdened by a lagging supply chain. And that speaks tremendous volumes. If you actually had a facility capable of producing you know, 90% of your product and didn't have to worry about any of the consequences of a supply chain, that's a big deal. Now granted, raw materials have to come in, but if they can remove that from the, remove the other parts, the other complexity from the problem, that's a huge deal. And that is a game changer in terms of production. And not to leave out the, uh, the boating industry or the marine industry per se. You know, here we have a propeller prototype that's actually in testing for a tugboat, high stress, high torque environment, and it was printed by using the WAM system, you know, your wire metal additive. And just think about how much dollars were lost in the casting industry that no longer gets to produce that propeller. And just think about how much potential money is gonna be lost by the casting industry that no longer can produce for some reason because this robot is running 24 seven, producing a super complex shape. Now, we've got more information on boating industry, everything from holes to the fiberglass applications, and then I kind of focus on the names, the names that people recognize that are announcing additive applications. You know, Toshiba, we've got everybody from Hershey's Chocolate to uh, you know Hasbro, toy makers, looking at additive for production, for research, for switchover, whatever the case may be, and you're just seeing these names, these companies that we rely on for contracts, saying we're going additive or we're looking at additive and that's warning signs and of course there's always the survey new survey by gartner that came out that had the predictions by 2021 75 percent of aircraft would have 3d printing parts on them surgeons are going to be practicing more and look at your consumer goods 20 percent of the top 100 consumer goods will use 3d printing to create custom products and that custom matters so i'll just kind of roll through do like to point out the new estimates are 12 billion dollars of this industry this year alone which is interesting because just a few years ago it was only uh four billion and it was only by or it was actually by 2020 so we're three times the value and two years ahead of schedule in where the industry is now i'd like to stop at take a moment to think about it from a different perspective too from a business model perspective this article actually came from harvard business group and it points out this specific thing about the hearing aid industry According to them, it, is, it was a switch over less than 500 days that 100% of the American uh, hearing aid industry switched over 3D printing. Any companies that did not are already gone. 
So this type of a custom product, that fast of a switch over for industry. And that matters because it's coming from the business side, <laughs> not the tech side. Huh? Did you paint? Uh, I, I, no, no, I don't know painting though. I don't have paints. Do you have a nail polish or Sorry, can hear there. Um, how, how was it? Also, this we're tracking lots of money, lots of companies, a lot of entities talking about all of this. Not anything uh, useful. Change. And I want to stop at this one specifically because this one's a big deal to us. This is what we're really focusing on in, in our region for a new type of model paradigm. Uh, many of you may be familiar with just Prusa, you know, the Prusa, the I, I2, or the Mark 3s, and all, all the good stuff that's coming out. I want you to look at their production facility. This article came out, they, we knew this for years, that they were using 3D printers to produce quite a, a high percentage of their parts for their printers. Um, so we actually ordered about yeah, five of them to do a yeah. test base and kind of evaluate what kind of production we were looking at where printers are actually printing printer parts. And it was amazing. The data was incredibly good in terms of production. We were, you know, the tolerances were great. The kits went together. It was awesome. But just look at the business model. Think about a facility. You know, they say they have, they'll have 500 printers by the end of the year or the end of the summer. And you're managed by 15 people running 24 seven, producing an international product. And at, at some point in time, and they may still be at this volume, they are producing 3,000 3D printer kits a month at this level of quality. And they're one of the most popular for the price range because they work and they're innovative. So in the article, they ask, you know, they ask, I guess, Joseph in this case, and they say, you know, why are you going this route of using your printers to produce your printer parts? If you're at this scale, why aren't you doing plastic injection molding, conventional tooling? And the statement back to the to the reporter or the, the writer is because additive gives us a huge advantage over conventional. And the advantage is this. First of all, we can produce much more complex shapes than conventional can. Second, we can constantly upgrade. Our workflow is so much easier. If they have a new idea, they can implement it without any retooling, without any real lead time, after testing, of course and they can implement a new design change. And you actually can see them do that over time. So they're existing in this constant beta where they can constantly improve their product. If one of their customers, so for example, us here in the lab, if we see a great design suggestion and we send it to them, they evaluate it. Our design concept could be in their production the next few days, maybe even a week. But they can totally pivot their manufacturing profile with no waste that matters no sunk costs either let's say for example they decide to go out of business as a printing company but they want to turn around and use their manufacturing facility to produce some kind of new widget they can the manufacturing capability of doing this is just unheard of it's the ultimate customer experience because you can constantly innovate without having to get your supply chain ready to go retool and you don't want to run stuff out just to use up the value of any sunk costs you just keep expanding, adding more printers to produce your product. Now, one of the things that I'm guessing is gonna happen pretty soon is that you're gonna see business articles or business, business journals take this up as a new form of a business model. And not only Perusa, we're seeing Lusbot do it too, we're seeing these uh, micro factories pop up because it gives you pivoting ability like we've never seen in terms of experience. The other thing we point out for a lot of companies and the small startups is they're used to software names like SolidWorks and uh, Autodesk and that kind of thing. And then we point out, look at the money these companies are spending to gear up for additive. You know, making deals, ANSYS, everybody is making deals to get into additive, buying small companies, and that matters. This report that came out by Stanley Black & Decker, big deal. Being able to actually look at almost an apples to apples comparison and they say this is a no-brainer for us definitely recommend everyone checking that one out because that's a volume company hybrid manufacturing being able to actually 3d print your your molds essentially to actually do conformal cooling to design your molds and be able to print them from the inside out so that they cool better increase production time great stories so we look at story after story we looked at the concrete we show them all the things that matter to their particular industry and then we kind of move on to say, you know, what's the point of all this? And the point is simply, this is happening, it is affecting their industry, and they need to get on board. 
So after that shock and awe experience, after people have seen all these numbers and data and just blown away after they've seen parts they've never seen before, we turn around and we, we offer them a deal. We'll say, all right, bring us a project. We'll do it for free. We'll do the engineering and the design work you need. We'll do it as a demonstration project, but we're going to take your idea and convert it to an additive solution and let you have the experience. You know, it's basically the first time's free to get them hooked. And the results are awesome. We've actually helped do a simple little project for a company, saved them $30,000 in four months by buying a $2,500 printer and producing a part out of FDA approved nylon that used to call, cost them $800 a pop. One day training and we were ready to go. We looked at another company, a small, a small startup. This, this gentleman's had this idea for over 20 years in trying to produce a particular type of design for the cosmetology industry had to sit on it because it just, you couldn't get it working right and the cost to get going was just too high for him. He shows up to the lab, we take the design in play, it's in testing right now. And uh, we're looking at showing him how to actually produce this with an $800 printer and for a fraction of the cost. And while, he, while we're showing him how to do that, he can be out there testing and getting his market ready to receive it. So it's not like prototyping and then we've got to switch gears to actually have it conventionally made. It is prototype and ready to go out the door in short run production and testing and then scale up as he gets more orders, all using low cost FDM machines, which is part of also this move to get the consumer market to accept additive created materials. And that's a big deal for us. Uh, other projects, we're doing some projects with some sanitation companies to create new customized sy systems for their uh, particular process. This was actually a great little project where we were able to get a machine tool company, a contract, well, potentially get a contract that they couldn't do because the price point was just way too high to do conventional. They had to pass it up. We came along, showed them how to potentially carbon fiber print this product using low cost machines and it's gonna bring that project back to life. We're also teaching them about optimization. And then the good stories, you know, the, the homeowner that comes up with a small idea to actually in, impact the essential oils market. I don't understand the essential oils market, but it's $16 billion industry. You can't argue with that. So they came up with a new product. They were actually ready to sell their house to get started with their first prototype conventional design. And we show them, no, you can do this for less than $3,000, which a bunch with a bunch of low cost printers. So the ag market, the weapons industries, every industry out there has applications for low cost production, not prototyping, actually getting the markets out there. And as a result, we're getting to make impact. People are seeing this, we're getting materials testing done, we're showing folks what printers work well for their situation, we're just getting it out there and getting into folks' hands, and we're not doing keychains, we're doing final products that people are actually gonna be able to sell. Of course, we're not doing it, we're showing them how to do it and then helping them get scaled up to do it over the process. A couple of things you gotta keep in mind with this, since people don't understand 3D printing, they keep wanting to think apples to apples, you gotta get them thinking apples to exotic fruit. So, you know, we use these little iris boxes to show the concept pretty well. People think they're cute and they think they're awesome once they see that all the parts were printed in place. We do know that maker spaces, you have to be careful with those. You have to make sure that you're not expecting too much of the person coming in. You gotta really help them along. So we typically take a person into our, our zone or our work area and say, what's your idea? We'll redesign it for additive. Then once they're hooked, we move them on. We, we show them what equipment they need to purchase. Maybe they're gonna hire one of our students, one of our technicians. We typically don't want them to become the person who's doing the printing because they need to be out selling their product. We want them to hire someone in to take it over for them. And you do have to say no a lot. You sometimes have to limit your focus to really get traction with some of these folks. And in our case, we just focus on case studies and help who we can, but sometimes we have to say no. It does take a team. So if you're gonna go with this model, one of the things that from an educational standpoint, what you wanna do is involve what we call the teacher, the hacker, or hacker and the hustler. And that's essentially a person to do the education side of it, one person to do the technical side, getting the products going, making the machines run, and one person that's just out there making deals and talking about the talk technology day in and day out. One person can't do it all. You probably can do it with two, but you can't do it for all. Overall, we have to show for it, impact. We've got companies using this for production. We've got companies coming online to use it for mechanical and maintenance operations. 
and we are training students, we're training teachers, and we're getting out there and our focus is use this for money-making applications because the materials are there, everything's there, it's just a matter of doing it. And you have one of the reasons we like low cost FEM is because you can fail a lot and it doesn't cost you much. So AM's exploding, but it's not exploding wide enough. We want to hit the grassroots folks instead of the upper levels and coming down. We want to bring the grassroots folks up. And since it can't be explained, you really just have to get people's hands dirty with the technology just over and over and over until they kind of see the difference. Metal is, is going to be key for our next step in actually getting that into the rural manufacturing paradigm, and that'll be in a huge explosion to itself. I'll kind of finish up with this uh, quote from Mr. Mook from GE Additive. It's a great quote. It's totally true. You're either going to be a leader in this technology or a victim, and we're seeing that right now. We're just seeing contracts dry up and new contracts exist, and if you can't do it, then they're just going to go to someone else. So, uh, again, my name is Eric Walters from Somerset Community College. You can give me a call directly there on the screen. You can also check out our uh, Facebook page. We actually do a lot of our uh, cool stuff out there so people can see and, and let people know of opportunities. You can also email me there, or you can uh, do a Google search. If you just search SCC 3D printing, you're likely to hit my potential page. But I welcome any type of questions you all have. Let me know. And I uh, do thank you very much for your time today.